good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. In uh, um, today's talk, as Jerry said, I'd like to show you how we have uh, utilized uh, ultra-fast X-ray scattering and spectroscopy methods uh, to probe uh, um, charge delocalization and solvent reorganization upon uh, uh, photo-induced electron transfer in a molecular complex. Um, so um, it, the uh, complex in question was uh, a bimetallic complex, uh, ferromolecule for brevity. And this will be the core of my talk. But before showing you these results, uh, I will start my talk with an introduction about uh, uh, the scientific motivation underlying my research and uh, with an introduction uh, on uh, time-resolved X-ray solution scattering, which might be uh, a technique uh, that uh, has been uh, um, less discussed in this uh, journal club. I will uh, uh, stop uh, at the end of each uh, section to ask if there are uh, any questions. Uh, so the motivation underlying my research are to understand uh, and with the ultimate uh, goal of controlling uh, photo-induced uh, charge transfer transition in photofunctional material, in particular transition metal complexes. Charge transfer processes are ubiquitous in nature, we can think of photosynthesis, and also in technologies that harness uh, solar energy, like uh, in dye synthesized solar cell, where sunlight can be transformed into uh, an electric current, or in photocatalysis, where sunlight is utilized to catalyze a reaction of interest, could be hydrogen evolution, uh, CO2 reduction. So in order to design uh, more efficient uh, functional material, um, it is important for us to understand uh, the uh, ultra-fast excited state dynamics that the molecule undergoes after light absorption. And uh, in particular, I've been focusing on understanding the nuclear motion that drive uh, uh, such dynamics. And nuclear motion can be uh, the intramolecular rearrangement uh, in the molecule but also involve uh, the structural reorganization of the environment surrounding the molecule, in my case, the solvent uh, environment, which has been shown to control uh, or to um, impact the rate of electron transfer reactions, but understanding the mechanistic details of, uh, uh, of this interaction, of this motion, uh, is still uh, um, uh, an ongoing topic of interest. So in order to shed light in some of these uh, um, uh, questions, uh, I've been using uh, ultra-fast X-ray methods. You are familiar with uh, pump and probe uh, techniques in which a laser pulse um, is uh, utilized to uh, photo excite the sample of interest and a subsequent uh, pulse uh, is utilized to probe the photo-induced dynamics. Now, in time-resolved X-ray methods, uh, the secondary probe is uh, uh, an X-ray pulse uh, in the, um, with wavelength uh, from the Armstrong to 10 Armstrong uh, regime, which uh, allow us to achieve uh, structural sensitivity if we use techniques such as elastic X-ray scattering, and also allows us to uh, get information about the electronic structure with element specificity. Then if we carry on this experiment uh, at uh, a uh, X-ray free electron laser, like the linear coherent light source, uh, which um, is a facility at SLAC, and it's where I've conducting the experiment that I'm going to present today, uh, then we can achieve for this experiment femtosecond time resolution, and we can really monitor electronic and structural dynamics in real time. So there is a... Um, uh, suit, there are the different uh, methods uh, that can be utilized to probe uh, reaction in solution phase. Uh, and uh, in this uh, talk, I'll talk about scattering, I'll talk about uh, emission and absorption. It's also possible to do EXAFs at LCLS, and uh, soon it's uh, um, uh, the high repetition upgrade. There is an high repetition upgrade um, that's uh, uh, coming uh, uh, fall next year, and this will make possible also photon hungry techniques such as resonant inelastic uh, X ray scattering. So, let me uh, first spend a few slides to talk about uh, uh, elastic X ray scattering. 
uh, here you can see the standard setup in which we have the sample of interest flowing through a nozzle and the, um, 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 the X-ray probe is usually in the hard X-ray regime between 8 to 12 um, or a higher if possible uh, uh, kilo electron volts. And the elastically scattered X-ray from the sample are collected onto a two-dimensional detector, which is placed after the sample as a function of the scattering vector, which is the difference between the incoming and the outgoing photon momentum. So this scattering signal contains information about the nuclei positions of both uh, uh, the solute and the solvent molecule. And for the concentration that we typically utilize for this experiment, uh, between 20, 80 millimolar. Uh, then we have uh, thousands of solvent molecule per solute molecule. Therefore, the total scattering signal is dominated by the scattering from the solvent. However, by taking the uh, different scattering signal, we just, um, uh, in the different scattering signal, we just have information about the photo-induced uh, structural changes. We then uh, uh, usually integrate uh, two-dimensional pattern in one-dimensional curve, which in my presentation I will show as a function of scattering vector and pump and probe time delay. So how do we analyze a scattering data set? Uh, I, I'm gonna exemplify this with this example in which we photo excite a cobalt in molecule in solution. Photo excitation leads to the population of uh, um, a high spin state of the molecule in which the cobalt nitrogen bond length are, were supposed to expand. And uh, you can see the measured X-ray data set here. And for the analysis of this data set and in general of uh, every X-ray scattering data set, it is uh, um, useful to think about this uh, um, signal um, uh, coming from three different contributions. The changes in the solute-solute uh, atom pair distances, which, which tell us something about the intramolecular structural rearrangement. The changes uh, um, of the solute-solvent distances, uh, which uh, tell us information about the structural reorganization of the first solvation shells. Uh, and then the uh, changes in the solvent-solvent atom pair distances, uh, which tell us information, for instance, about the heating uh, that the molecule is depositing uh, into the environment uh, when relaxing back to the ground state. So this heating contribution can be measured in separate experiments, so I will not discuss about that during this presentation. Uh, while for the uh, solute and the, um, we can call it solvent cage uh, contribution, uh, this can be uh, calculated uh, with the help of TFT or molecular dynamics uh, simulation. In particular, for instance, for the uh, solid solvent term, if we, have, uh, if we run a molecular dynamics simulation, then we can calculate uh, the solid solvent uh, radial distribution function that are easily Fourier transformed directly into scattering signal that can be compared to the data. So for this data set, for instance, you can see that for each time delay, so for each one dimensional curve, um, the data can be described uh, with the model uh, uh, I just told you about. So we have uh, the red line here, which uh, is the heating signal. And then we have the blue line, which in this case uh, comprises both the solute and the solvation cage signal, uh, which is mostly this low Q negative uh, um, signal, which is usually indicative of an expansion of atom pair distances. And in the model, we can introduce time-dependent structural parameter. In this case, uh, it was the cobalt nitrogen bond length. So therefore, from the data, we retrieve uh, um, information about the, uh, the changes in that structural parameter. So in this uh, plot, which is the results of the fit, you can see that the cobalt nitrogen bond length expands with respect to the ground state um, and then relaxes into the high spin equilibrium structure, which um, and the value is found approximately 0 0.13 Armstrong longer than the ground state. You can also see that this, there is an oscillation on top of this general uh, expansion. And uh, um, we can probe with scattering uh, uh, a wave packet dynamics. So in this case, uh, by comparing uh, the frequency of these oscillations uh, with the um, uh, DFT calculated uh, uh, vibrational modes of the molecule in the high spin state, uh, 
we could assign uh, this uh, vibration to a breathing-like mode, which uh, initiate immediately after photo excitation, and a pincer-like mode of the molecule, which is subsequently activated. If you uh, are a little bit suspicious about the oscillation that can be maybe seen very weakly in the data. Uh, I'm going to show a, a different data set, which was taken a few years after this original data set, which um, implies uh, improvement uh, in the setup in the detector. And, uh, and you can see in this different data set, which was recorded upon photo excitation of this uh, uh, diplatinum complex, which is a model photocatalyst. Uh, you can see uh, very um, nice oscillations in the scattering data that arises from the um, initial contraction of the platinum platinum bond length and subsequent the wave packet uh, dynamics, which last for, uh, for this sample for more than two picoseconds. And by analysis of this data, we can retrieve a structural information with a sensitivity of around 0.01 Armstrong with respect to the uh, structural parameters. So with this, uh, I think I've shown you when, that we can use uh, time-resolved X-resolution scattering to probe a key structural parameter in, uh, um, uh, in, uh, uh, in molecules that changes after photo excitation. And, uh, uh, and that we've used this technique to probe photo induced wave packet dynamics and to track uh, vibrational redistribution of energy. And uh, uh, this was an example of how we can use scattering to probe intramolecular structural dynamics. And uh, in the next part of the talk, I'm going to show you how we can use scattering to probe also the solvation uh, um, uh, reorganization. But first, I want to stop to ask if there is uh, any question. Um, uh, just a, a very background question. So this was done at LCLS. And... Um, you showed many different time delays out to 20 picoseconds or two picoseconds, three picoseconds, yes. something like that. So um, uh, uh, that was done with um, a time delay between the 60 hertz pulse and the laser pulse, yes? Uh, yes, it's uh, 120 hertz. Uh, but Sorry, yes. I apologize, 100, 120 hertz. Um, uh, what is the, uh, uh, the, the stability, a typical stability of the time delay between the laser pulse and the XFEL pulse? Yeah, so that is measured with uh, uh, a timing tool. That's what uh, we call it. Uh, it's just a silicon nitrate membrane that measures the arrival time of both, uh, of both pulses because the intrinsic jitter uh, for the arrival time is around 600 femtosecond. But with the implementation of this timing tool, you can uh, measure the arrival time of both pulses with an accuracy of 10 femtosecond. So the uh, time resolution is actually uh, limited by the uh, uh, laser and the X-ray probe uh, pulse length, which is around 40 femtosecond, and by the thickness of the jet, because there is, uh, uh, there is some mismatch uh, between the traveling time of the two pulses uh, along the jet. Okay. There is around uh, one femtosecond mismatch per micrometer. So, in this, uh, so for typical uh, ex experiment that we have run so far, in which we have a 50 micron uh, jet and then uh, a 40 femtosecond laser and X-ray pulses, we achieve around 80 femtosecond time resolution. Okay. Okay. Um, Yulia, uh, you have a question? Yeah, I have two questions. Uh, so the one is technical, one is general. So you showed this uh, cobalt complex, I believe, and simulations. If you can uh, go to that slide. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, the one which had like simulation from calculation, like nice plot. Maybe one more. This one? Uh, I, uh, th there was like insert with like very high data quality from which I, well, yeah, yeah, this one, this one. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you show here vibration from calculations. I'm just curious, um, how is it difficult? Um, are there any vibrational spectroscopy like time resolved FTIR or time resolved Raman, which can uh, kind of confirm um, or like, you know, as a second thing, like second technique, uh, to show those vibrations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely there are, yes. So I was not aware of any 
study that was done on this specific uh, cobalt terpene molecule before we did the X-ray experiment. Uh, um, so there were some other st studies that were studied in the spin stain transition uh, that would report on the elongation of the cobalt nitrogen bond length, but not study in, uh, in solution. Uh, but I, it would be probably be possible to measure with different technique, yes, uh, the vibration. In the case of the PT pop, for instance, this is a very well studied molecule, and there are many, many optical uh, uh, techniques that have been used to confirm uh, um, the frequency of these oscillations. Yeah, pretty cool. And the second question is very technical. So we have from long ago uh, data on the scattering on this detector, and I think that's the same detector. Yeah, so it's in um, C CXI. Is it like CXI Hutch detector? Um, so we have most of this experiment that we have done at XPP at the CLS, not at CXI, but uh, I think the detector might be the same if it was the CSPED uh, detector. Mm -hmm. Because we have a uh, scattering data from long ago, like when we did the damage studies just with manganese ions in solution, we did X-ray emission, and we also have entire scattering data set, but we could never process it because I think it's very hard to know the detector background. Mm -hmm. And I guess yeah. you figured out all those technical issues uh, so maybe uh, uh, can... yes when was your experiment done uh, i can look it back uh, i don't remember the, the, we published in 2019 so probably two years prior to like or, uh... 2017 Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I mean, it is, uh, it is uh, quite uh, cumbersome uh, to analyze uh, scattering data, and, uh, and uh, now I'm just showing you the final results and not the, all the dirty works that there is uh, before, uh, before that, of course. Um, it helps a lot uh, looking at the different scattering signal, so then the background uh, should cancel out. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, for instance, we employ a method in which we take the off image uh, uh, every seven on pulses because we realize that the subtracting images that are collected uh, in, in real time uh, very close to each other helps uh, with respecting uh, uh, with, uh, with respect to do what we do with the synchrotron usually which is collect all the off images uh, then the first time delay then the second time delay and so on and so forth so that was uh, fundamental for our data analysis uh, if that makes sense and then there are a lot of other tricks to get rid of artifacts uh, um, we also look, uh, found that there are some uh, non-linearities sometimes uh, showing up, but it can be eliminated through that analysis. If you want, I can point you to some resources uh, uh, after the talk. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. And just one last question. I think you said it earlier in the talk, but I lost track of it. Um, uh, during a single shot with the with all the focusing, roughly how many of the molecules of the uh, sol of the solute are uh, uh, are in the beam? Uh, oh, that's a good question. How many molecules? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I will have to do a calculation. We have a focus which is around. Uh, uh, could be around 30 or 50 micron. Uh, for the laser, it's a bit higher than that. Uh, and we have concentration between, uh, let's say, 50 millimolar. So I will have to run the calculation now. And the excitation fraction are usually, uh, I don't know, between 10 and 50 percent. Okay. All right. We can work out the numbers offline um, uh, about that. But it's certainly uh, uh, vastly more than a single molecule scattering experiment. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, for sure, for sure. Okay. All yes. right, I think that was that may have been the main point in, yes. in the question. All right, thank you. You should continue. Uh, okay, thank you for all the questions. So before going to the next uh, section, I'm going to already acknowledge uh, the people uh, who have, uh, um, who are part uh, of the, uh, I call it the Feru collaboration. And so this was a project that was uh, uh, the main PI were Munira Khalil at the University of Washington, Niri Govind at PNNL, and Bob Shonley at Slack. And for instance, Chelsea's in Munira Group did the analysis of the X-ray absorption data that I will show at the end of the, of, of the talk in the last section. Niri and Amiti at the PNNL did uh, some of the um, uh, calculation. And at Slack, uh, other than Bob, uh, Amy Cordones, Kelly Gaffney, and Catherine Ledbetter also uh, did a major contribution in the work. 
And of course, I shouldn't forget to mention the, to acknowledge the Beamline scientist at LCLS for the support. So we investigated this uh, electron transfer in this uh, iron uh, ruthenium uh, um, complex. We have an iron atom, which is linked through a cyanide bridge to a ruthenium atom. And uh, 800 nanometer laser pulse can uh, um, promote electron transfer from the iron to the ruthenium, uh, thus switching the oxidation state of the two metal centers. And this metal to metal charge transfer transition is followed by ultra fast back electron transfer. So this iron ruthenium molecule belongs to a class of uh, uh, mixed valence complexes that have been studied extensively uh, since the 80s uh, to understand the electron transfer reaction. And uh, we did the X-ray experiment to, um, in particular, to look at two open questions. Um, so in the 80s, Barbara measured with uh, transient absorption a back electron transfer time in water of around 90 femtosecond. And he saw that this uh, back electron transfer time was solvent dependent, thus concluding that the solve plays a critical role in the electron transfer process. However, since optical methods are not directly sensitive to structure, um, these studies could not really uh, point at the specific solvent motions that might impact the electron transfer reaction. In particular, uh, both the cyanide uh, ligands and the amine ligands surrounding the ruthenium are ligands that can form strong hydrogen bondings with the uh, surrounding uh, um, solvent environment in our experiment of utilized water. And uh, the hydrogen uh, bonding interaction between the solute, between the ligand and the solvent molecule are supposed to be weaker in the excited state with respect to the ground state. But the mechanistic details of this interaction were unknown, so we utilized X-ray scattering to, to look into this. And the second question is the, for these uh, Ferru and similar mixed valence uh, systems is, can we quantify the extent of charge uh, delocalization? Um, so in the ground state, the odd electron is localized in the iron, but the, uh, excite, in the excited state, we wanted to know if the odd electron is 100% localized in the ruthenium or if it could be shared between the two metal centers. There are different uh, ways to uh, classify mixed valence systems uh, from more localized system to uh, more delocalized systems, but all these classifications are often qualitative and we were looking to, um, to see if we could utilize X-ray to quantify um, uh, this, uh, the extent of electron uh, delocalization. So we did the LSLS experiment and uh, uh, we used 30 millimolar of ferru in water uh, flowing through the liquid jet. We utilized uh, X-ray scattering and in combination to scattering, uh, we set up uh, two different spectrometer. A first spectrometer, a Bonamo spectrometer to detect the iron K-beta and a second spectrometer, a Roland spectrometer, to detect uh, the iron K-alpha fluorescence from the sample. And uh, um, uh, so I, we achieved uh, uh, for this experiment also around 80 femtosecond time resolution. And uh, uh, I'm going to show you first the results of the analysis of the scattering and the iron K-beta data that we collected with uh, having the X-ray energy fixed at 8 kV, so above the iron K edge. And then I'm going to show you last the results of uh, collecting the uh, K alpha intensity as a function of uh, um, scanning the incident uh, energy across the edge. In this way, we collected the absorption uh, or we retrieve the absorption. Um, and I'm going to show you the information that we got from this uh, uh, in the last part of the talk. So by starting from scattering and the K-beta, we utilize the analysis of the K-beta data to give us uh, a um, uh, measurement of the metal-to-metal charge -metal transfer transition lifetime. And that's because the iron K-beta line is sensitive to the oxidation state of the iron. You can see here the, um, the difference in K-beta fluorescence between uh, the two model complexes, an iron-2 and an iron-3 um, exocyanide. 
so we have a shift uh, as a function of the oxidation state. And, uh, and here on the uh, bottom, you can see the uh, transient data that we collected uh, after photo exciting uh, the iron ruthenium molecule. So if we take uh, um, uh, here for a specific time delay, 50 femtosecond, you can see that the transient signal, the blue line, can be well described by the uh, difference uh, between uh, the iron-2 cyanide and the iron-3 cyanide, meaning that we are observing a change in oxidation state of the iron due to the electron transfer to the ruthenium. And if we model, if we fit that this, uh, then, then we fit this uh, model uh, signal, this reference signal to the full data set, we could retrieve the excitation uh, uh, fraction and the uh, per each time delay and therefore the uh, metal-to-metal charge -metal transfer lifetime which we found around 62 femtosecond. Then we could uh, utilize this information on the electronic dynamics uh, to in the analysis of the scattering data. So here I'm showing you the scattering data as a function of the scattering vector and of the pump probe time delay. Uh, so as I show you at the beginning of the presentation, we can think about uh, 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 of this data set uh, coming from these different contribution, the intramolecular, the reorganization of the solvent shell and the bulk solvent, uh, the heating contribution. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna subtract the heating contribution, which can be measured in separate experiment. And we are left with this uh, signal in mostly localized in the low Q part of the data. Um, this signal starts with a negative signal in the low Q, which is indicative again of expansion of atom pair distances. But then we also have these uh, features, uh, positive features that seems to travel towards lower Q as a function of time delay. And if we take a cut at 0 0.5 uh, um, inverse Armstrong, you can see this oscillatory, um, uh, let's say, pattern in the data. So to understand where this signal comes from, we started by doing some uh, uh, DFT calculation, TD DFT calculation of the ground and the excited state of the ferro molecule. And we embedded that in water boxes to calculate the correspondent uh, solvation shell structure. And you can see in this plot, the uh, scattering signal that we got from this uh, calculation. So the blue line here is the, in, the scattering signal that arises from the intramolecular structural rearrangements. And the magenta line is the uh, scattering signal that arises from the uh, solvation uh, signal. You can see that the blue line is negligible with respect to the solid solvent signal. Therefore, we uh, concluded that uh, uh, the, uh, the majority of our signal should come from solvent reorganization and not from intramolecular rearrangements, which makes sense if we think about how fast is the back electron transfer, 62 femtosecond, which is not enough time probably for the iron and the, and the ruthenium and the other heavy solute atom to rearrange significantly. So once we uh, uh, decided that this was, uh, or understood that this was coming from the, uh, this is a solvation uh, signal, then we ran out of equilibrium molecular dynamic simulation in which uh, um, we take several snapshots in the ground state, then we switch uh, the partial charges of the solute molecule to the excited state value to mimic uh, the metal to metal charge transfer transition. And then, uh, after uh, at the back electron transfer time, uh, we reverse uh, the partial charges back to the ground state value to mimic uh, the back electron transfer. And we did this for different back electron transfer time accordingly to the uh, excited state dynamics that we got from the iron K beta data. And then we did a weighted average of this uh, non equilibrium dynamic simulation. And at the end, we got this as a final result which you can see uh, like side by side with the data can describe uh, quite well, uh, both uh, in scattering vector and in time, uh, the main features that you observe in the data, uh, reproducing these low Q oscillations. So now that we have a simulation that describes the data, we can utilize the simulation to understand what are the solvent motions uh, giving rise to this signal. And I'm gonna illustrate that by showing you the, um, 
radial distribution function of the nitrogen oxygen uh, of the nitrogen of the ligand and the oxygen of the water molecule surrounding uh, uh, the ligands. So, for instance, in this plot, I'm showing you the nitrogen of the cyanide and the oxygen of the surrounding molecule. Starting from the bottom, uh, that's the radial distribution function in the ground state. Then when we switch the partial charges to the metal-to-metal -metal transfer state, we see this radial distribution function starts shifting towards higher Q value, towards higher hard value, sorry. And then when we switch back the charges to the uh, ground state, mimicking the back electron transfer, in this case around 70 femtosecond, the radial distribution function reverses its motion, overshoots the ground state position before relaxing back. And so this uh, yields a, a oscillatory motion, which is a clear error if I plot the maximum of the radial distribution function as a function of time. And from the analysis of this, uh, we can achieve information, for instance, that the um, water molecule moves away from the molecule with a velocity of 2.5 Armstrong per picosecond first. And then upon back electron transfer, they come back with this coherent motion, which has a period of 160 femtosecond, which is in agreement if we look at the optical spectrum of water to the frequency, which is usually assigned to translations of water molecule. And this would, uh, these uh, uh, results would be the same if we, uh, if I analyze the nitrogen and the oxygen uh, with respect to the amine ligand that are ligated to the ruthenium. Um, so we have the water molecule that in this case also moves away from the complex and then com comes back upon electron transfer, back electron transfer. So, to summarize what we could conclude from the analysis of the scattering data in combination with the iron K beta uh, data is that we have uh, we directly observed ultra fast coherent translational motion of the water molecule that are hydrogen bonded to the ligand of the complex. And these motions arise from a change in strength of the hydrogen bond. Upon metal to metal charge transfer, the hydrogen bonds are weakened. And so the molecules move away from the complex. And then when we restore the ground state, uh, the hydrogen bond strength is restored and the molecule can come back uh, with this uh, coherent, uh, coherent motion. And we could conclude, uh, and more studies uh, are on the, on, on the way, that uh, this uh, motion then must contribute to the reorganizational energy of the electron transfer process. And uh, here I'm stopping again, and uh, I'd, like, I'd like to ask if there are questions. I'll ask a brief question first. Um, uh, there's a, a large literature on changes in the K alpha K beta branch ratio based on oxidation state. And I was curious, did you look at the integral of the K alpha and the K beta to see if it changed with the, uh, with the, the, the ultra fast charge transfer? Oh, uh... I have not done that. It doesn't say, I don't think it's been done at LCLS yet, but I think it could be a terrific way to very quickly um, see whether, whether you're getting charge transfer. Uh, you just have to look at the integrals of your, uh, on your two spectrometers. You don't even need full spectra. But yeah. fine detail. There's more interesting questions waiting in the chat. So to start, Yang Ha, you have a question? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if it's a fair question. I'm just trying to brainstorm in here. So with your method, can you actually figure out the equilibrium constant between the ground state and the excited state, say based on the relative ratios of the two peaks? And since you have BFT calculations on these two, you can probably figure out the energy difference between the two formats. And I'm not sure if these two methods can cross check each other. Uh, the energy difference between uh, the uh, between the ground and the excited state. Uh, right. So yeah. So okay. Do you an equilibrium constant, or I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just mm -hmm, asking. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so with respect to the equilibrium constant, I don't know if it is, uh, I need to think about that, if it is applies uh, to this study. So what we got from the analysis of the data is the excitation fraction. So the amount of, of uh, molecule that we excite in the metal to metal charge transfer state. Uh, and then all these molecules de decay back in 62 femtosecond. Uh, so very fast uh, back to the ground state. Uh, so it's, uh, um, yeah. Um, Yes, I'm not sure how to go about this, except for the fact that we could uh, quantify uh, the population dynamics in this way. And with respect to the energy difference, uh, yes, it's true. We add, uh, sorry, now I need to jump <laughs> a lot back into the calculate, into the backup slides. So yes, from the calculation, uh, so I've not looked into the DDFT and the QMM calculation, that might give the answers you're looking for, but I've looked into the out of equilibrium simulation to calculate, for instance, the organization energy of the, uh, of the, uh, of the electron transfer process. And, uh, and um, I must say more studies needs to be done because uh, these molecular dynamic simulation are very good in reproducing structural changes. But uh, um, let's say quantifying in kilocal per mole or in energy units, uh, uh, your changes uh, um, can be misleading for this calculation, depending on which force field uh, you use. In our case, we didn't utilize polarizable force field, and that led to an overestimation of the energy involved in the process. So they're very good for calculating structure, but maybe not very good uh, to give you a reliable estimate of the energy. But for the energy difference uh, uh, and not the organizational energy, I would look to the uh, TDDFT calculation and uh, I, I can get back to you about that. I don't know the number now. Great, thanks. You, uh, pardon me, uh, Julia, you have a question? Yeah, uh, I, of course, can read the manuscript. I think that's all published. So I wanted just to know more about the details of calculations. Mm -hmm. So uh, was it quantum MD and which package you used? Yes, so the uh, quantum mechanical part of the calculation was uh, done by Niri Govind at PNNL. So um, he had a long trajectory of uh, uh, QMMM in the ground state, uh, but calculating a QMMM in the excited state uh, would, have, would have been too computational expensive uh, uh, to get enough statistics to calculate a scattering signal. So that's the reason we instead utilized MD simulation. But anyway, uh, from the QMMM ground state trajectory, we uh, selected uh, several snapshots, and then he utilized uh, TDVFT uh, to um, excite to the metal to metal charge transfer and they are calculate uh, uh, the structure uh, corresponding to the metal to metal, uh, to the excited state, explicitly considering uh, a shell of water molecule surrounding the complex. And uh, I have uh, some detail of the calculation uh, later on. I don't know if I have. Uh, um, I think he used the PBE zero as functional for this and SPC for the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, last question in this break. Uh, Kawei Zhao, you have a question? Yes, thank you. So all the examples given so far are intramolecular charge transfers. So I'm wondering, is it possible to study autosphere uh, charge transfer using a similar method where I think that solvent reorganization or even desolvation might play a role. Uh, yes, so you're asking if we could study uh, uh, charge transfer to solvent, for instance, so where we ionize the molecule. Uh, um, more likely, say, here you, are bound, you have a bond between the ion complex and the, uh, and the other complex, but in the autosphere complex, these metal, metal ions are probably bonded to solvent molecule directly and they are not bonded direct, uh, and the metals are not directly bonded. So I'm wondering, is it possible to study these cases? Yes, yes. I think it, it is possible, absolutely. And, um, and the, um, let's say one thing to consider is the sensitivity that you have uh, uh, to that uh, solvent cage. 
in the sense that for the example that I've showed at the beginning of the presentation, for instance, for that uh, the platinum complex, uh, um, in, in that case, for instance, you have a heavy platinum atom that contains a lot of electron, and they are going to dominate uh, the scattering signal. So even if there is uh, a signature in the scattering data from the reorganization of the solvent shell, and there is going to be one if the solvent shell is organizing, it's going to be negligible uh, with respect to the signal that comes from these heavy atoms uh, moving. So in this case, uh, the backlighton transfer was so fast that the iron routine molecule was not uh, uh, changing uh, considerably the structure. And that's the reason the data, in the data we have sensitivity to observe the cage. So in conclusion, yes, it's possible. You, you always have a signal that comes from the cage. The point is that uh, can you distinguish that uh, or is that uh, uh, strong enough to overcome the signal from the molecule itself? Thank you. Okay, you should continue, please, Elisa. Okay, thank you. So before continuing to my next and last section, uh, I want to say that uh, I'm looking for a postdoc. Uh, actually, there are two postdoc openings in the area of ultrafast chemical dynamics and ultrafast X-ray science. And so the postdoc will utilize the time resolve X-ray scattering and spectroscopy methods to look at photo-induced charge transfer uh, for molecules in solution. And uh, the postdoc will be based uh, at SLAC. And so if you are interested or if you know of possible candidates uh, that uh, might be interested in a postdoc in ultrafast X-ray science, uh, they can apply directly through the PNNL career portal with this job ID, or feel free to uh, send application or any questions uh, uh, to me. And uh, so for the final part of the talk, uh, I'm gonna, uh, so I've shown you how we analyzed the information that we got from the scattering and the iron K-beta data. But I also told you at the beginning that we had a Roland spectrometer set up to measure the iron K-alpha. So in this case, uh, the, uh, so the spectrometer was aligned to detect uh, the most intense uh, K-alpha. So like uh, where it was set at the peak of the iron K-alpha spectrum. And we recorded that intensity as a function of, uh, um, of uh, scanning the incident energy. And this might reply to your question, Jerry, because in this case, we are basically just um, plotting intensity as a function of uh, time delay and not recording a full spectrum. And, uh, and from this analysis, we also saw the same back electron transfer time around 62 frames per second. Uh, however, um, in this final part of the presentation, I'm not going to show you this. I'm mostly going to show you that from this intensity, it's basically we're basically retrieving uh, the X-ray absorption in high energy uh, resolutions, um, uh, uh, so the Earth T Xane's spectrum. So uh, to illustrate uh, the information that we get from this spectrum, I'm showing you the Earth T Xane spectrum of the iron tree cyanide. And the features that appear in the spectrum can be um, uh, can be understood uh, in a simple uh, ligand field uh, uh, picture. So we have a first feature, the A peak, that comes from promoting the core electron to the hole in the T2G orbitals, being this an iron three uh, molecule, there is a hole in the T2G. Then we have the B features that comes from promoting the 1S electron to the EG uh, orbital. And the uh, absorption at the C peak uh, that comes from uh, um, promoting the electron from uh, uh, to the uh, ligand uh, pi star. Uh, so if uh, we uh, look, uh, so this was the spectrum for the iron three model complex, which is the blue line here. If, for instance, we look uh, at the iron two model complex, which is the green line, then the A peak disappears. Uh, because for the iron two, the T2G shell is completely filled, so we cannot, uh, cannot no longer promote an electron in the T2G. And for the ground state of Ferru, that's the case. Since the ground state is an iron two, we don't have this A peak. So we were thinking, okay, we can monitor changes in uh, the exane spectrum of Ferru to see oxidation, but also we had some calculation that, that um, indicate us uh, that we could use the X-ray absorption as a probe to the charge uh, uh, delocalization. So at the beginning, I told you that uh, one of the questions we were interested in uh, answering was to under quantifying uh, the amount of uh, electron delocalization in the excited state. 
And so uh, Niri ran some uh, uh, calculation. So he promoted the molecule to the metal-to-metal -metal charge transfer state potential energy surface. And then it took, uh, uh, it let the molecule propagate in that surface uh, and uh, it calculated the absorption spectrum at different point uh, along uh, such surfaces. So for instance, uh, starting from the um, left here, immediately after the photo excitation, the electron is still mostly localized in the ruthenium. So we have a uh, 10% uh, uh, um, whole charge at the iron. And you can see that the uh, spectrum has only basically the B peak. Then, uh, for instance, when the, the electron is halfway in between the iron and the ruthenium, so we have 50% whole charge at the iron, the A peak starts appearing because we start creating a hole in the T2G orbital. And uh, when the, uh, the electron is, com is completely moved to the ruthenium, uh, right, uh, the, uh, the A peak is mostly separated from the B peak. So basically, I'm showing you three examples, but we calculated different uh, structures on the MMCT. And what we concluded is that the energy splitting between the A and the B peak is uh, linear with respect to the iron uh, hole charge density. And so we thought, okay, if we can uh, see where the A and B peak are in the excited state of Ferru, then we can use that as a ruler to understand uh, the uh, amount of charge delocalization in the excited state. So that's the reason we did the experiment. And uh, in, in this case, the signal, the count rates was not very high. So it was not possible to really scan uh, the time was other than the energy. So we got only one transient uh, signal, which is the uh, black line here, um, that basically corresponds to the difference between the ground state and the metal to metal charge transfer state of Ferru. And you can see that uh, it kind of resembles uh, the difference uh, between an iron 3 and an iron 2 exocyanide, so that the features. Uh, um, kind of agree with the change in oxidation state. Uh, but then in order to have quantitative information, we uh, reconstruct the, uh, reconstructed the difference scattering signal by having uh, as the difference between the ground state and the excited state spectrum. And in the excited state spectrum, the A and B peak position were left as free parameter. And from the results of this uh, reconstruction, we could find from the data a splitting uh, uh, of 2.6 uh, uh, electron volt uh, for the AMB peak in the excited state. And then we could compare that value to the calculated uh, values. And uh, we could conclude that uh, according to the linear relationship we established from the calculation that, the, um, uh, that there is a 75% whole charge density uh, at the iron for the excited state of uh, Ferru so that the electron is not completely localized at the ruthenium, but is still a tiny bit shared between the two atoms. And um, I want to remind that this, uh, the analysis of this part of the data set was done by uh, Chelsea in Monira Group. And the, uh, the results are, uh, have been submitted and are available as a preprint. So to summarize this uh, final part, uh, we have utilized time-resolved iron k edge earth dig sains to, um, in combination with uh, state-of-the-art calculation, to measure the valency of the iron atom in the excited state of the ferro molecule. And we concluded that we have 75 whole charge density at the iron in the excited state. And uh, we believe that uh, as energy and time resolution at the X-File facilities improved, uh, these kind of measurements will be useful to probe the electronic delocalization in mixed valence systems and other relevant uh, photofunctional material. And this was basically the end of my yeah, uh, presentation. So I wanna thank all of you for being here. And uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if there are some final questions. Sure, there'll be some final questions. Uh, I'll start off with one. Um, you showed how you were getting at the uh, the whole population on the iron by looking at the pre-edge features in the zanes. Mm -hmm. um, was there enough counts to try and look at the K beta and how that was changing um, uh, uh, with uh, uh, with with time delay or at these uh, specific time delays? Uh, yes, for the iron K beta. 
which is the analysis I showed in the previous part of the oh, presentation. Okay. Sorry, right? sorry. So it, it was just, uh, um, I mean, the old signal was just well described by this uh, reference uh, uh, signal, which was the difference between the iron 2 and iron 3 exocyanide. So it would just indicate a change in oxidation state. Yes, I'm, rem I'm sorry, I'm remembering now. Yeah, so yeah, remember. exactly. So that was for the iron K-beta. Instead, for the xanes, uh, we found this way uh, this this uh, to be sensitive to the only this uh, let's say to be sensitive to the to this uh, charge of the localization. Okay, yeah. Where do you see another metal metal charge transfer problem where the methods you've shown us here can be useful? Um, yes. So in general, uh, I think when we have. Uh, um, general for any bimetallic complex in which, uh, or mixed valence systems, right, in which we want to study electron transfer from, uh, from uh, these. So uh, these methods could be useful. So there is uh, in literature this uh, Robin Day classification that uh, um, classify electron transfer, uh, yes, as a um, So the idea was to um, a little bit uh, apply this method to, to this question in which we have dropped in the classification that says that mixed valence systems, uh, which are any bimetallic complex where the two metals are in different oxidation state, um, the odd electron could be localized and that would be a class one system to de completely delocalize that would be a class three systems. Uh, and since this uh, kind of classification are kind of qualitative, we wanted to utilize the X-ray to answer this. But in general, for any functional photofunctional material, it would be important uh, after we uh, photoinduce the charge transfer or the electron transfer to be able to understand uh, where the electron uh, really is, uh, let's say, along the molecule, if it is uh, more on the bridge, more on the ruthenium, and uh, how we can tweak uh, this uh, delocalization, maybe changing the structure of the molecule or the solvent environment in order to make the molecule do what we would like it to do, if that makes sense. Um, that, makes, that makes perfect sense. Um, uh, one last question. Um, uh, uh, LCLS2 is coming and there'll be much faster rep rate. And so two branches on this. The first is for the present kind of study, what's the impact of the higher rep rate? And the second question is, um, RICS, you mentioned earlier that, that RICS was coming because of the, the faster pump rate and maybe you can, uh, faster exfil rate, and maybe you can talk about those two, uh, those two issues. Yes, exactly. So specifically with respect to this uh, presentation, right? So, um, the scattering data and the iron K beta were measured in pink mode, so with the full flux of the X-ray beam. Instead, when we utilize a monochromator to measure, for instance, X-ray absorption, um, then the flux is much lower uh, because we select a tiny uh, uh, you know, part of the X-ray pulse. And that's uh, why this, uh, this is, uh, yeah, this count rate is very low, also because of the efficiency of the spectrometer. So definitely having high repetition rate, so having 10 kilohertz uh, instead of 120 hertz, uh, will definitely allow us to do this kind of experiment uh, more reliably and more routinely. Uh, so for X-ray absorption uh, measurements uh, and even EXAFS uh, measurements uh, where you want to scan, uh, um, you know, a wide uh, uh, energy range, uh, that would definitely be, be useful. And even if you want to study dilute uh, complexes. Uh, so right now we still need uh, uh, like around 50 millimolar uh, concentrated sample, but uh, some, sometimes uh, even in yeah, um, you want to study molecules that are difficult to synthesize, so you don't have grams available of this molecule. So definitely if we increase the signal to noise, then it will be possible to do this experiment in dilute complexes and maybe study more, um, and not more, but uh, relevant uh, chemical systems uh, other than mother complexes. So this is uh, with respect to the general impact of the high repetition rate. And with respect to RICS, uh, yes, so the, uh, that would, so RICS has been demonstrated in the, especially in the soft X-ray uh, regime. And the high repetition rate is coming up uh, next, uh, next fall. 
And uh, that, I think uh, we are all waiting for that. It's very exciting. And uh, there will be some troubleshoot to do, of course. Uh, but that will allow to access uh, the um, um, ligand decay edges uh, of the material. So the nitrogen K edge, the oxygen K edge, uh, for instance. And, uh, and so we can have, uh, with this method, we could have a complementary view. Because right now we can do, with the hard X-ray pulses, we can look at the edges of the metals. But now with the RICS coming up, we could look at the view from at the same reaction from the point of view of the ligand. And I think that would be very helpful. It will also be possible to do RICS at high repetition rate in the hard X-ray regime, but that will come a little bit later, at least at the LCLS, like in two or three years from now. We have one last question from Richard. You should go ahead and ask your question, Richard. Hello. Um, I'm, I'm not really familiar with the scattering topic. So my naive question is that, of course, scattering experiments in, in the hard X-rays are really advantageous compared to, to using soft X-rays. But would these experiments in principle be possible also with soft X-rays? So one could use labor, laboratory sources, for example, HHDs. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, on the other side, I'm not very familiar for, uh, with uh, a harmonic generation. Uh, it's definitely, we're talking about, um, so from what I know, uh, nitrogen K-edge and oxygen K-edge are a little bit already too hard <laughs> edges for uh, have enough counts at the HHE. And then there are uh, maybe... Um, yeah, I think the when we have the high repetition rate, uh, now I'm sorry, I don't have numbers uh, to, to, to give you, but I think that when we will have uh, the high repetition X-ray available, uh, this should give a higher signal to noise for this kind of experiment than an H, uh, a harmonic generation experiment. But, um, um, but definitely there are complementary complementary tools right so the advantage of uh, uh, of having uh, uh, of doing higher monitor generation is that you can have a tabletop instrument in your lab right and uh, and xfile experiments are very difficult to get because of uh, the success rate of the proposal you submit so there are definitely advantages of doing an uh, hhg experiment um but from what I know, and that is very little on this topic, I think the X-ray should give a higher uh, count rate, higher signal to noise uh, uh, for this uh, for gas phase and solution phase experiment. Mm 